find someone that's successful and say, hey, listen, I'll run around. I'll get your dry cleaning. I'll pick up your coffee. I'll, I'll do your chores. I'll walk your dog for your lunch. You know, I'll do the stuff to make your life easier, to save you time. In, in exchange, please, can you just help mentor me in, in whatever the industry is? So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I am here today with Lawrence Dunning, who is a, a fellow Brit like myself, but who also left his homeland many, many years ago and is now based in Chicago. Um, Lawrence is a real estate investor and he's got a very interesting journey that he's gone through in life where he was retired very early in his life um, and then had to sort of start again from scratch, from zero at the age of 35. So welcome to the show, Lawrence. Lovely to have you here. Thanks, Deborah. Likewise, lovely to be here. Yeah, so it, it is a really interesting story. So you um, you kind of rose very quickly in your career. Tell us a little bit about how the, how you got to where you were, and then what happened at that sort of you know um, thirty five year old point in your life. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was lucky in the sense that um, I I finished my I got my degree in in uh, Exeter, a small city in the south of England, and in in England the system's a bit different. I'm not sure the listeners are in the US or in um, New Zealand or Australia, but in England, you have to pick your major when you're 17 years old. So you're, you're, you're still a kid and I was, you have to pick a subject, you know, very early on. So I liked history and I liked the idea of not having many classes. So I, I got a history degree and then I'm coming up to graduation. I'm thinking, you know, what the hell am I going to do with a history degree? I, I don't really don't want to be a history professor. You know, I, I wasn't really sure what to do. And I was actually training at a martial arts gym and I wanted to keep training for one more year. So I decided I got into this MBA program and I thought, well, you know, I've, I've always, I've always been interested in finance and I would trade a little bit. I would invest in stocks. My dad had me doing that when I was a teenager. I would have these um, you know, weekend and evening jobs and I would get some money and he would help me invest in different stocks. So I had appreciation for the financial market. So I did this MBA in finance and then I was actually planning to uh, to spend a few years after that and, and, and go to Australia and New Zealand and just travel and enjoy life. I figured that I've got a lifetime to work. So when I, you know, before I start my career, I'm just going to have a few years off and, and be a bit lazy and enjoy life. Then um, my uncle, who I was very close to, he just met somebody at a dinner party and he said, I just graduated. And about two days later, he called me up and he said, Lawrence, I just had dinner with this guy. He works for this trading company in London and they're really doing really well. They're expanding. They need people like you. And I said, well, I thought, well, rather than traveling and just enjoying life, if I go and work for six months, maybe I can make a bit of money. I can still do my plans, but I'll have a bit of money, have more fun. So I went for this interview and it turned into a, about about 12 interviews over two days. And I saw all these young guys making all this money in London. And I thought, you know what? I can put off, put off my dreams for a few years and you know, I can do really, really well. So I got the job and after a week, they actually sent me to Holland. Um, there was the Dutch exchange in Amsterdam. So I worked there for a year, I was kind of training. And then they said, okay, you're ready. You, you know, if you go to the US, we're trying to grow in Chicago and we have an office in Wall Street in New York. They sent me there. So I was, in, I was on Wall Street for a few months and I was back in Chicago for about a year. And as I started to make money, I realized that they would take almost all of it and they would pay me this little sliver, you know, that's part of being with a company. They don't, you don't have any downside risk, but you don't have too much upside either. And uh, one of the older guys there, we, we, we traded a lot together and he said, Lawrence, like you and I could do really well if we just set up our own company. But he was one of those guys where he was all just talk, you know, talk, talk, talk. And then, so I actually sat down, I wrote a business model. I figured out how we get some loans to buy these trading seats and go off on our own. And so he and I left and we started our own company and we did really, really well for a few years. You know, I worked really hard, but I was also lucky. I was in a, I was trading in the U S and there was a lot of business. I was trading um, options on government bonds and there was all this money to be made. So I did really, really well. And then he had a bit of a breakdown just from it was, it's a trading's a very stressful environment and he was mm -hmm. drinking a lot in the evenings and he would come over hungover and try and trade all day and he was just burning the candle at both ends yeah. so it got to the stage where he and i just couldn't work together so we went our own separate ways and then i was the only person running this trading company and it was a lot of stress for a young guy in his 20s and it got to the stage where i remember i just turned 30 and i realized i had made all this money but i hadn't my, my standard of living hadn't changed so one thing i was self people is if you want to create wealth as you make money, you can't just increase your standard of living and then you'll never get anywhere. You have to kind of keep a standard of living. And then as you make more and more money, just save it, invest it and things like that. So it got to the stage where I was 30 years old and I realized like on paper, like, wow, I've got, you know, a huge amount of money in my, in my trading account. And I've got these dreams that I can't do. Um, I can't do when I'm older. And I was, I was an amateur boxer and I was doing jujitsu and I had this dream about being a professional MMA fighter because I thought it would be so, I, I found the challenge so difficult. So 
there's two types of people that compete in combat sports. There's the guys who are just ferocious and if they weren't fighting for money they'd probably be getting drunk and fighting on the streets and there's the people like me where it's terrifying for them and they, they want to face their fears and they find the challenge very interesting so i so i took about five years off uh five years sabbatical and i was doing that and i figured in my head that when i'm finished i can just go back in the trading pit and keep making all this money but i didn't realize deborah that as as time changes opportunities are not there all the time you have certain opportunities at certain times and during the time I was away, the big companies came in with high frequency trading and my business model no longer existed. So then I got to the stage where I'm blowing through all my money. I'm having a great time pursuing my dreams and traveling and just enjoying life. And then I suddenly realized when I turned about 35, like, well, I can't go back to trading because all my friends down there are leaving the business. You know, what am I going to do? And that was a that was an early midlife crisis for sure. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so then what did you decide to do? So luckily, I had a very good friend that I lived in the same building um, in a high rise downtown Chicago. And he and I both had dogs and I would see him just walking his dog and we got to chatting. He was a very personal, personable guy. And he kept telling me, he said, Lawrence, you know, he was an attorney and he had a little uh, law company, but he said he, he wanted to start a real estate company. And he said, you know, you could do so well in real estate. You've got this English accent in Chicago. You're, you're personable. You're a smart guy. Like you could really do well why don't we do this together? We'll work together. We'll, we'll, you can get your broker's license and be a broker, but you can also, we can work in rehabs and flips and developments and all these different things. So thankfully he convinced me to, to, to get my license and start working with him. And it's one of those things where when you switch careers as you're older, it's very, very hard because I think when you're young, when you're in your early twenties, you're used to kind of being a beginner and not really knowing what you're doing. But when you've had a certain amount level of success, it's it's very, I personally found it much harder to go back to almost square one to relearn a different business, to reinvent myself. Um, so that was definitely a challenging period. But looking back, I'm very glad that not only that I did it, because I think it's really important to put yourself in positions where you're forced to grow, but also that I that I just became friends with somebody who I'm still friends with to this day. He still owns my company, the, the umbrella company that my trading company is under. And he's still my real estate mentor. So I was very, very lucky. I think that's the one thing, Deborah, I want to stay, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. But I think so if you are so many people who are successful on paper, um, you know, what do you attribute the success to? They'll say, you know, intelligence, hard work, taking good risks, all these things. But very few people would say luck. And I, I definitely think that I had the fortune just to meet him and just we just got on very well. And the first few years I picked his brain, you know, all we were friends, so I would see him all the time. I would pick his brain about everything and anything for, for years and I'd learned so much from him. So that really that importance of just having a mentor. He was a mentor without realizing he was a mentor. He was a friend who was a mentor with, you know, just by being my friend yeah. and us hanging out. So I think that's so important. <laughs> So I think I think you're right. There can be an element of luck that puts you in the pathway of certain people, but there's still you actually have to put your hand up and say, "Hey, look, I'm, I I want to pick your brains. I want to find out things." I know when I was working in corporate world, um, I really desperately wanted to to go and meet with a group CEO because I felt that as the head of marketing, I should really be meeting with a group CEO who who knew what the business was doing and I could then best support the business. And I bumped into him in the lift one day and I said, "Hey, look, um, I'd love to kind of pick your brains on a, on a regular basis, just so I can make sure the stuff we're delivering fits in with what you got." long for them for the business and he went sure no problem at all go and see my secretary get yourself booked in so I booked in a, a monthly catch-up with him when I went back downstairs to my office and to, to the team that I was working with my boss was like well you can't do that and I said what do you mean he said well you know he, you're a level three and he's a level one and you're not meant to kind of meet and I said well I asked him he said yes and so I went ahead and did it and and most people don't don't put their hand up and don't actually take that opportunity to go well let's give it a go let's see what I can actually learn from these people so I applaud you for, you know, so for, for doing that yeah oh no I'm so, I'm so glad you said it there bro because that's that's true and I've noticed that with a lot of people is they have so much potential but they're almost waiting for it to literally fall into their lap yeah. And you do have to be a bit of a go-getter and you have to put yourself out there a little bit and then the, the reward will come back, you know, massively. But without you doing it, unless you're incredibly unlucky, there's not going to be someone behind you to push you every step there. You do have to take the initiative like you did. Yeah, absolutely. And like you did too, like I said, you, you went and picked that guy's brain, which is fantastic. So it, it is hard when you change, isn't it? You know, when you change a career, I think it, um, you're right, when you're younger, it's it's a bit like it's a bit like young kids learning to ski, right? I think that we wonder how they, they are so brave. Well, they don't really know what it's like to fall over. They just see other people doing it and think, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. And then as adults, we kind of grow up and we get more fearful and we go, oh, well, I don't know if I fall over, I might hurt myself. Or if I go to a new role and I'm not good at it, I might look stupid. Um, so what was it like, you know, 
know, when you when you're in your yeah you know, thirty five years old, starting a new career, how did you overcome that that inner critic that sort of talk about well you can't do this or you're not you're not good enough or you know yeah you know, the things that pop up for many of us at times. Deborah, I'm so glad you said that because that's the um, what do they call it the uh, oh, blanking on the word, but it's uh, the feeling of not being good, imposter syndrome. That's imposter the word. Syndrome, yeah. I think the number of successful people I've talked to, even just recently, I've been really fascinated by the idea of the imposter syndrome, and I've been talking to a lot of people that I look up to in different fields, and almost every one of them have had to overcome that. And I think the easiest way to overcome imposter syndrome is to actually become competent. And how do you become competent? You have to put the time in. So I think for, for me, I had that mindset where I knew that I wouldn't make a lot in the beginning, but I wasn't trying to make a lot of money. What I was trying to do is become competent and learn. So the first year in, that I was in real estate, I took so much terrible business that I would never take if I was just trying to make money. But I knew that by being busy and active, I would meet people, I would develop relationships and I would learn along the way. So I tried to have a long-term mindset. And I, I think this is important for anything. I had the same thing when I was um, learning martial arts, you know, you're not going to walk into a gym and train for a week and get your black belt, you know, you have to put the time in. So I had that long-term, um, it, it was the first year I wanted to develop as, me, as much skills and knowledge so I can actually provide value because I know when I've got the value, I'll get paid for that value. So I had that 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 same approach that I had with trading because I remember with my trading company, I they didn't let me trade for them for a year and a half. And then I traded for them for about a year and a half before I started my own company. So I'd already been trading in effect for three years with someone else's money before I was risking my own money. So I spent the first three years learning, um, learning a lot, just skill development. And I did the same. So I did the very same thing with real estate I knew that it would be rough and it was rough. The first year, I, I always joke that I took home the first year in real estate the same that I could make in one good day of trading. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. much money, but I learned so much. And a lot of some of those clients I met the first year, I'm still working with now on huge projects and with, with great income for me. But I had that mindset. And I see, I always tell people, start, you know, there's a, in, in America, there's a common saying, I'm not sure if you have it um, in New Zealand, but they always, they say, if you start a new business, you shouldn't even expect to be profitable for the first two years. The first mm -hmm. two years is just about getting really? getting the the skills and the knowledge and building the relationship. So I think having that long term time horizon is is, is definitely uh, was definitely the key for me. And I think it's the same with anything. It's like with, with your relationships, with your personal relationships, with your professional relationships. If if you know you you do something that in that week or month or whatever it's not going to make you too much money or sometimes it might even lose you money. But if you develop a good relationship, you'll have that relationship the rest of your career. So it's having that long-term mindset, I think is really, really important. And I think we were just talking about this before we came on the podcast. You know, there's um, there's all these people promising the magic silver bullets or the hat life hacks that will make everything, you know, tw 10 times as fast and everything will go. Hold. But it's in reality, um, most of the successful people I've worked with and talked to, it's been grit, determination, execution, just really um, consistency that has got them to where they are. Would that be fair to say for you as well? 100%. And it's one thing that... Um, it's become a bit of a joke among my friends because like like you and I, I love the fact that we're kindred spirits in many ways, Deborah. I love to travel. I know you, you get a lot of traveling too. Yeah. And but real estate, when you're dealing with clients and people, you have to be somewhat available. So I, I tend to work 365 days a year. And of course, when I'm traveling, I'm on vacation with my family. I'm not working all day, but I will be available at certain times to check in. So I think you have to have that consistency is so important in business and just people knowing that if you're a factor that you're available um so I, I, and it's some people would see that as a huge chore i don't mind working an hour or two a day on vacation because i can take as much vacation as i want you know i'll i'll, I'll sacrifice the need to be connected in order to have the freedom to live the life that i want to live and it's funny, so we talk about work-life balance and, and we always talk about, you know, you should have time to do. So you should be doing what you love with people you love, but having time to pursue other passions. And and to me, work-life balance doesn't mean working Monday to Friday, nine to five, and then taking weekends and four weeks holiday. It's like you said, it's about achieving the flexibility to do the things you want to do when you want to do them. And if that means, you know, on the weekend, I'm often thinking about work. I can't just turn off and go, well, that's it. I'm not there anymore now. Um, but it does mean that, yeah, I get to travel the world and do, I'm going to Canada in January. January, US in February, you know, doing all these things. And I will still be doing some work on there. So I think the work life balancing is an interesting one because if you love your work, um, it doesn't actually feel like work for a start. But secondly, it is about having that, that real flexibility to do what you want to do when you want to do it. 
Exactly. And I think that the whole work-life balance is much more complicated now anyway, just with cell phones. Because I remember yeah. thinking when I was growing up, when I was away on a weekend trip with my with my dad, I used to, my dad used to take my brother and I for a lot of hiking. Um, yeah. We'd be hiking. That there was no way his company could have even got hold of him because it wasn't cell phones. But now <laughs> most people do expect to have some kind of communication with you or they want you to be checking in at least once a day. And actually most of the um, people that I look up to that are very successful, they will, um, it, when, when I've been with them on vacation or at, when they're not in their um, city of work, I've noticed a lot of them do have that where they spend an hour in the morning just checking in or an hour in the evening. They kind of, they, they're always available and you don't have to be, but I think in a lot of, a lot of, businesses where uh, they are time sensitive and real estate is one where I think a lot of things is time sensitive you do have to be available and then of course the end goal would be um, and which is I'm in the middle of, middle of doing is where if you're planning to go away and you know you, you don't want to be available then you just have to have someone who's competent of your team that can take over that the, the big challenge for me is people want if they want you they don't necessarily want your team member and they, they almost see it as a bit of a, sl a slight where oh you know call call john he's gonna handle it I was like, oh i kind of want you lawrence you know so uh, but most people are very understanding that we're, we're all juggling um family and i have noticed i've been a dad for the last two years my, my son's about to turn two people are a lot more understanding when you have a when you have a kid so that makes life a little bit easier so i mean i i I'd probably get to disagree with a little bit i do think you we do have to take time out and sometimes we do have to really take time out so there are times when i actually do say hey look um the world's not going to end if i take a whole week off and disconnect for a week and i think having that that chance to have real a real clarity break is is quite important but what do you do to relax like i mean I, you know it's it's difficult when we do love what we do because as i say work doesn't feel like work but what do you do to actually completely disconnect yourself from business from um from the, the pressures and the stresses, how do you get that clarity in your mind? Well, one of the things that, um, the reason that I decided to take that sabbatical um, when I turned 30 was because I looked at what I did at the weekend and when back, back then I was much more kind of the trading hours. So I was Monday to Friday when the trading floor was open mm -hmm. and there was nothing to do at the weekends and in the evenings. And I noticed that I would be, I would be in the gym training a few times and I would, that's why I decided to take the sabbatical and pursue that because that was the, my real passion. Now I'm a bit older, um, just like you, and we were talking a bit off air, but just like you, I find um, nature very uh, rejuvenating. And um, and yeah, just to clarify, if I, it's, I'm in an industry where it is a bit more time sensitive than a lot of industries. For instance, if you have a closing and there's certain things just before the closing, and there's a lot of people relying on it. You do have to be a bit more connected, but you can always outsource it. So I just want to clarify, you don't have to work every day. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> I think getting in nature is, is and traveling, I think there's a huge thing with just being in a new place, whether it's in some, a new city, you're walking around just seeing a new, a new thing. I think humans evolved and a lot of us, we have this natural curiosity. And I know that's one thing uh, you have in your bio about your curiosity and challenging the mm -hmm. status quo. And the reason, I love uh, traveling so much is because I think it, it it satisfies my curiosity and sometimes you have to get out of your bubble and that's when you can really think clearly and you can reassess the direction of your life and your long-term goals. I find it very hard to do that in my day-to-day, -day, just kind of too many things in my mind. So I actually, I love reading. I'm a huge reader and I think it's it's becoming harder and harder to do because I think the world collectively is all becoming more and more distracted with technology. So that's one thing when I'm, when I'm away, I love yeah. just being somewhere warm my wife and i both love the sun and um spending time quality time together and now now i've got a son i love i love you know waking up with him and spending all day with him and going to bed with him when we travel with him but sometimes it's nice just to, to be a be a couple and leave him behind and, and reconnect and put our relationship first um so i love you know yeah. being somewhere warm you know we, we have a little uh, a happy place that's hawaii uh, we have a hotel we'd love oh. to go there it's very it's a bit away from everyone else it's very secluded and peaceful and if i go there for five to seven days i feel like a, i'm reborn so that's definitely yeah that's how i rejuvenate excellent i love it yeah we do have some major similarities there which is good so i'm really intrigued because as you said you're, you're happily married you've got a son that's two years old now um if you could go and give your son some advice um to help him with his growing up what would it be? What have you learned from your journey so far? Deborah, that's, I, I think about that all the time. I really do. I think um, <laughs> it's such a fascinating um, thought experiment because I obviously want him to avoid the mistakes I made and I want him to be successful and have this wonderful life. But I also know, because I'm, I'm realistic, that 
it's one thing me telling him and it's another thing him making a mistake and learning from it. And I can try my best, but I know that he's going to have to go through a lot of growing pains, you know, naturally. So I think a, a few things that I really want to impart on him. Um, one of them would be don't peak too early. A lot of people peak in high school. You don't want to peak in high school. You want to peak a bit later. So try to have that long-term, um, definitely a long-term uh, perspective. The other thing is, um, I think that when I was trading, they used to tell us every time you do a trade, you've got to think of your risk and your reward. So your risk mm -hmm. is how much money you could lose and the reward is how much money you can make. But you can imply that with anything. Like if you're if you're dating and you're scared, you know, I, I was, if I was scared to ask out my wife to dinner when I first met her, if I look at the risk reward, well, the risk is that she turns me down. I don't lose anything, but the reward is she could be my, you know, my soulmate, my future mm -hmm. wife. So you, you can apply that metric to everything. So I want to teach, I really want to teach my son about the importance of of having good risks, taking good risks. So mm. for instance, if he's if he's drunk and his friends are trying to get him to drive them home or something, that's a terrible risk and reward, right? There's no reward. The reward is you just, you save a bit of money taking an Uber. But the risk is, you know, you could, could be the, you know, the end of your life. So that I want to teach him good um, risk management. And I also want him, this is a really tricky one. I want him to develop hardships and learn and learn to be resilient. And that's really hard as a parent because I've worked hard because I want him to grow up in a nice, nice area. I want to provide him, you know, live in a nice house. So I, I, part of my drive is to give him comforts, but I don't want him to grow. I think there's a problem we're seeing. I don't know how, how much you're seeing this in New Zealand, but definitely in the US, we're seeing this problem with a lot of troubled kids that have these parents that they're not there very much. They're very wealthy. They work all the time. And these kids are just addicted to all these different drugs and they're just getting it. They just don't have any drive and life is too easy. So mm -hmm. I, I think the best thing I want to give him, and not necessarily to be a competitor like I was, but I want to give him the gift of martial arts because I think it's it's a superpower. It gives you confidence, and I think the the journey of of it's a very linear effort between you put time into something and it's hard, and then you see the results as you gain a skill in something. And I think that's such a so I think sports, whether it's martial arts, you know, I actually played soccer when I was young in England. I know soccer's a big thing. And I, he's he's already kicking a soccer ball around. He loves to run. So I just want him to find his niche in some kind of sport and take it to a pretty high level. Cause I think the the lessons that he can learn from that are gonna provide him um, you know, set him in, in a really good stead for future. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, I, I was also very sporty when I was at school, and I think there's, yeah, there's, there's, it teaches you teamwork. Um, it teaches you how to work with a coach because you know you have a sports coach who's there to kind of do it, and you can take all of those things into um, discipline. You can take all these things into your your business life and your personal life as you move forward as well. So you've mentioned, you know, you you had mentors. Are you working with a coach or a mentor right now? Uh, I work with so many. <laughs> yeah, good. I, have, I, I thought I you would. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have um, what I consider my real estate coach. I have someone I consider my entrepreneurial coach. I, I started a podcast about a year and a half ago, and I have two people I consider my podcast coaches. I <laughs> yes. have uh, my martial art coaches still. Like, and I think that's that's one thing that you, you said in your bio that I couldn't agree more. You said, to be a mentor, you must always be a student. And I think mm -hmm. the same thing. Like, I think a, a good life, a rich life, a balanced life, is you're you're surrounded by three different types of people you're surrounded by people that you're trying to help that are, are less advanced in in whatever you're like if it's real estate it will be like a new agent who's starting and he's trying to grow and build if it's my jiu-jitsu i teach jiu-jitsu too on the side if it's a, it's a new oh, yeah. jiu-jitsu student who doesn't know what he's doing those kind of people that you're trying to help them get started and share your wisdom and then there's the people that you're still trying to grow from your mentors that you look up to and you're trying to learn from and then so those two, I think you have to have them both. You have to be helping people, but you also have to be getting help to grow. And then I still think you need peers to be competitive with, to bounce ideas off around, you know, friendly comp competition, obviously, too. I think that's really important. Um, so, so I think to have all three, it's it's not easy, but I think most most of the time, if you go, a lot of people will be scared, like, like you were a go-getter in finding that mentor. And I think a lot of people feel nervous to kind of approach busy people because most mentors by definition are going to be very busy, right? Because they, they mm, reach this sure. level of success. They successful. tend to be a little bit older. Yes. And their time is so valuable. And um, it's, but most people, they're very, there's nothing greater than someone coming to you as long as they're not saying, Hey, can you help me get to where you're at? And I don't want to do any work. I, I get a lot <laughs> of those where they almost want to stay. They're at step 
two and they want to get to step 40 without put doing all the other intermediate steps. That's just a bit yep. annoying. They're just trying to just, you know, be, be a bit lazy. But if someone's genuine and they come to you or what I, what I would do, what I always tell people is find someone that's successful and say, Hey, listen, I'll run around. I'll get you dry cleaning. I'll pick up your coffee. I'll, I'll do your chores. I'll walk your dog for your lunch. You know, I'll do the stuff to make your life easier to save you time. In, in exchange, please, can you just help mentor me in, in whatever the industry is? And I think most successful people would do that. They, they would they, Most successful people, they, there's a great book called Real Estate Titans, and it's about 30 or 40 short chapters on these incredible real estate people that have spent you know, 60 years in real estate, and they've built these incredible empires. They've made incredible amounts of money. And the one thing mm-hmm. that struck me when I read it was nearly every single one of them at the end, the arc of their career, at the, at the end was all about um, giving back whether it's their time, their money, their knowledge. So most successful people, if you catch them at the right time, are going to be willing to help. Now, of course, there's going to be a successful person. Maybe if if they just had twins four four months ago and haven't barely slept in four months, they're probably the wrong person to ask. You know, so you have to find people at the right stage of their career to be there. Uh, but I think yeah. most people are. They do. They, most most successful people. They do. They they get. A, there's a lot of satisfaction in mentoring, and it's almost like a responsibility. And I'll use jiu-jitsu as an example, but they say when you're a jiu-jitsu black belt, even if you're not a full-time instructor, it's your responsibility to give back to the art and to teach new students. So even if you're not a full-time gym owner, you still should be teaching whether it's, you know, a couple of classes a month, whether it's a class a week, whether it's helping out when the, when the instructor's sick, but it's almost your responsibility to give back. And I think it's the same for business. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, you, as you said, you've got to pick them at the right time. I remember um, very early on in my career, I had, there's a guy called Rod Drury who started Zero over here. And he was a friend of mine, colleague of mine. We'd catch up for dinner and things. I said to him, look, would you mind mentoring me? And at the time, you know, Zero was growing massively. He was on a number of different boards. And he actually said to me, Deborah, I just can't. I don't have the time. And initially I was absolutely devastated. And I thought, actually, no, it's good. It's good that, um, that he's recognized that because if he said yes and tried to do it, it wouldn't have been a great experience for either of us. Um, and it was just time things so you can't take it personally you just have to go okay well that that one didn't work but there'll be somebody else who will so yeah good advice um so what's your podcast about you got two you said so um uh no no just sorry just one podcast just so one it's um, two podcast mentors that's en- right yeah yes yeah, go. sorry um it's called enter the lion heart so my nickname when i was fighting was lion heart because uh, i had a my coach said i had the heart of a lion i had i i had a lot more um What's the word? Like, I, I don't think I was ever physically gifted, but I had a lot of tenacity. So that's where that came from. Mm. And that's, it's, it's really just about all the things that I'm interested in. And because the thing is, a lot of, I have a lot of different interests, but I feel like there's a lot of crossover. So for instance, I love, I love martial arts and, and health, but I also love entrepreneurship and business. And I think that to be the best entrepreneur or to be the best business owner, you have to put yourself first and you do have to have interest. You have to be, I think if you're physically healthy, you're going to be better. You're going to be, you know, mentally sharper. And so it's about all the things I'm interested in, but I feel like there's a lot of crossover in terms of, um, you know, what, what makes a life worth living. And I think just like learning, I I keep coming back to martial arts, which it's just, it's an easy way to, um, to to use analogies, but it's like, just like, when you walk into a martial arts gym and you don't know the first thing and after a few months you actually learn techniques i think that you can learn techniques for building a business techniques for living a good life you know that there, there is certain like we, we mentioned before you still again there's going to be a lot of times where you have to roll up your sleeves and get dirty hustling and grinding and putting the work in but I, there's certain cheat codes to make that work go further um, by having certain principles and i think that's what it's about it's about trying to learn from people and, and I learn from every single conversation and, you know, I'm learning from you. you. You're reminding me to put myself out there and reach out to some people, some, some people that I want to learn from for mentoring, um, because I can, I can get lazy with that too. So I think mm-hmm. it keeps you accountable by having these kind of conversations. And yeah. like I said at the beginning, and I, I repeat myself, but I think what, when you said to be a mentor, you have to be a student, there's a old martial arts saying to be a master, you must remain a student. It's the same mm-hmm. principle. You have, we have to keep this growth mindset. And I, I know some people have that fixed mindset. Some people have a growth mindset. I don't know where mine came from, but I know very early on I had that mindset that I might suck at something, but if I put the work in, I can get better. And I think that's such a good message to remind people is it doesn't matter where you are. We can all grow. It doesn't matter if you're 20, if you're 40, if you're 60. There are these wonderful stories about, you know, there was one famous Russian author, I can't like 
Dostoevsky or one of those, I can't remember exactly who, but he, he, he picked up the violin in his 80s. You know, like we can always yeah. pick up these new skills and passions. You know, it's never too late. And I think that also keeps you young by doing these things, by putting yourself in a, in a position of discomfort or putting yourself at the bottom of the learning curve. I think that's what makes life interesting and fun and makes a rich life. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So I always ask our, our, our guests to give some tips for our listeners because I think it's, you know, it's wonderful to hear stories, but it's also really good to go, hey, these three things are the things that I think have really helped me on my journey. What would be your three things that you'd like to share? Uh, well, firstly, we kind of touched on it, but I really want to emphasize because it's so easy to neglect your physical like your health and your body and everything in pursuit of business. I've seen this with these people where when they were young, they were very fit and they played sports and then they got in the corporate world and they just let themselves go. And then now I'm at that age in my forties where you can, you can, uh, you can uh, burn the candle at both ends for a while, but it catches up with you. And I've got these friends who are in their forties and they're having a lot of health issues from, I, I think forties is so young to be having all these health issues, but that's what happens when you just put the business before your health. So I think, there's no amount, I think no billionaire on his deathbed would ever wish for more money. They'd always wish for more health and more time with their family and loved ones. So I think the first thing I'll always say is to be your best self and to be the sharpest mentally, you have to look after, after yourself physically. So physical health and also mental health, we're in a crisis in the US. And I think I think around the Western world, um, pretty much ever since co- the COVID shutdowns, mm-hmm. I know that mental health is skyrocketing. And my wife's a therapist and she's she, she's just always turning down clients because she's there, there's such a demand for her services, you know, for, for therapy because so many people are struggling. And I think if you're struggling with things, one of the best things you can do for yourself is just physical exercise. And I know for me, my mental health is I love to go for long runs. I live on the lakefront in Chicago and I just run up and down the lakefront and it's it's my happy place. And I think, that, it, trust me, I'm not some kind of person that I don't, I, I'm sure people are listening. Oh, it's, it's easy for him to say that. It's not easy for me. I'm, I put a lot of miles on my body. My knees hurt, my back aches, I get tired, <laughs> and I'm overwhelmed. You know, my, kid, my kid wakes me up in the morning, I don't get much sleep. But by forcing yourself to get out of the door and start moving, whatever, it, even if it's yep. just putting a podcast in and going for a brisk walk for an hour, it helps so much. So I would say the first thing is move, physical mm-hmm. health. Yep. Um, the second thing, I think we, we kind of touched on this again, is invest in yourself. So don't try to cut out the middle step and say, how can I make money? Say, no, no, how can I become, find a niche? I think even it, within a business, so for instance, for real estate, if I just said, hey, I'm a real estate agent, um, most, pe- most people I know know five or six agents. But if, if I specialize and I say I work with developers and investors on investment properties, which is kind of my niche in real estate, then people associate me with my niche. And it's, it's a way to market yourself. And it's a way to differentiate yourself. And it's a way to provide value. So the second mm-hmm. thing would be don't rush the step of investing in yourself to get the, the money. Invest in yourself and provide value and the money will come. I, I, I strongly, strongly believe that. Yep. I think the third thing... I was just on the phone before we started this conversation with a very, uh, she's, um, she's not an official real estate mentor, but I, I was joking to her and I said, every time we talk, I learn something from you. She's an older agent who's been in the business for about 25 years. And I've been in real estate for seven. So she's been in the business a lot longer than me. She's seen a lot more ma- market cycles than me. She has a wonderful disposition. And we were talking about relationships and she was telling me about some of these, how she met some of these builders she works with now. And she's like, I've been working with these people for, you know, 15, 18, 20 years, like these, these are longstanding relationships. And how do you develop relationships? Well, you develop relationships by providing value, obviously, but also this is something that no one teaches you in business school, but I want to stress it because it, it always makes me laugh when I think about it, is by being a nice person and by being personable, they don't teach you that when you, when you study business, but it's so important. When I was working at my trading company, they had um my trading company from London eventually broke away from the London office and the US office kind of went off on their own and they cut, they cut about 40% of the traders and they cut some traders that made not, not the best traders, but they, they were profitable. They made money and they kept this one guy who was a great guy, hilarious, but he was new and he didn't know what he was doing. He never made any money. <laughs> he made the cut for one reason because they liked him being around because he was funny and he was great energy and everything. And I used to, used to think when people talked about energy, I was like, yeah, it's kind of woo-woo nonsense. You know? But it's not. It's so true. Mm-hmm. Every time when you look at your phone and you see a name pop up, 
you you get two feelings. One is excitement or one is like, oh, I don't want to talk to this person. And it's just like when I when I read your bio, I, I was so excited to talk to you because we're such kindred spirits. You're mentioning these things. And I'm like, I, I feel the same way, you know, that you're good energy, you, you know. So I think that's so important is just to try and be a good person and provide value, but just be nice. You know, it's, it's not it's not hard to do. And I think it'll, it'll take you a long way in business, but no one really talks about that. But it is so important. Yes. Nice, be nice, but also be authentic. I suppose you know they don't want to be just sort of falsely nice, but yeah, um, exactly. Life's, don't be fake. life's too short, right, to not be enjoying what you're doing. And this is what I say to people: is you know we talk about doing what you love with people you love, um, making a huge difference in the world, but having that time to pursue other passions and being compensated appropriately. And in reality, if you're finding that you're going, like it's like that phone call, right? If you're picking up the phone and you're gr- grimacing because the person is calling it, same with your job. If you're going into work every day and you're hating what you're doing, and the thought of going into work makes you feel ill or just makes you feel unhappy you've got to do something about that because life is too short to be doing that day in day out make some decisions get there'll be another place where you'll find your happiness again Deborah I'm so glad you said that because you know ultimately so many people focus on money but really the most important commodity is our time mm-hmm. and and our health to enjoy our time and I think when you start out in business by by necessity you will be working with people that you don't like that your energy doesn't match with mm-hmm. But then most people in most businesses, as you become somewhat successful, you can choose who you want to work with. And I've told clients, like I've given clients to other colleagues, I've said, listen, I'm really glad you brought up being authentic because I'm not being fake nice. I generally like almost everyone I work with. And if I just don't, for whatever reason, we don't get on, I'll normally give them to somebody else. And I'll say, hey, you know, I think you'll be a better fit. And of course, you can't do that when you're starting off. When you're starting off, you have to do whatever you do. We do ev- everybody, everything. We'll do whatever it takes. I know exactly. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. But I really think that's that's the, the the definition of success is just working with people you want to be around. And that's something, listen, I'm not there yet. I still work with them. Most of my clients I really like. Some of them, they, they do frustrate me. And over time, that's just my goal is just slowly, you know, keep whittling down people that I don't really have a good connection with and eventually it'll be a hundred percent of people for work when the phone calls I, I do want to talk to them yeah 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 perfect hey got that's really great three great tips so yeah first of all look after yourself make sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself you've got physical and mental health get up and move in the morning I actually think getting up in the morning and going out for a walk even if it's just a walk or a cycle which we do each morning it, it the the mornings I'm not able to do that because I have a very early start they're just never the same I think there's there's obviously that thing about getting the sunlight getting out there getting the fresh air just makes a huge difference um don't yeah don't forget to invest in yourself don't look, don't look for the quick wins and trying to bypass all the steps find your niche do really well at it add value um, and then you're yeah, developing relationships and being being authentic but also being nice and being kind I think it's really important so thank you for those hey if people want to have a listen to your podcast where I'm sure you share a whole lot more about these things that you love where would they where would they find that what's the name of the podcast yeah it's called enter the lion heart and it's on spotify and itunes um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah the, the very different episodes one one episode might be you know focus on more jiu-jitsu and martial arts one might be more on finance and entrepreneurship um, but yep. I think the theme is just trying to trying to be your best self and um, a lot of people told me Deborah they said you know if you do a podcast you really you, you want to have a niche podcast too and but uh, coming back to your comment I'm so glad you said the word um, being authentic that wouldn't be authentic because I don't want to just talk about one certain thing. I, I do have different interests and I think most people do. And I think you want to be as authentic as you can be. So it, it does, there, there is some different, different topics, but I think there's a, the, the common commonality and there's a lot of crossover between them. And I think that's what's beautiful about life is as you get a bit older and, and you, uh, you start to look back more, you see there is these common themes between a lot of different things. You see this consilience of knowledge and, and this crossover. And I think that's really beautiful. So um, mm. it does, uh, it does come down to one of my, one of my mentors always says, almost every decision you make, there's, it's either love or fear. You're doing it from love or you're doing it from fear. Or the more, as you get older, the more you can try and do things from a position of love and not from a position of fear, the better your life will be. And that would be an example of like these, like there's, tips and things we can learn and then the next level is learning principles that kind of run almost over the, the principles run over the different topics and, and different divisions in your life and i think that's yeah. uh, that that's where when you when you say be authentic that applies to everything it applies to your work it applies to your relationships your friends you know, your hobbies yeah absolutely agreeing that's fantastic hey so if people want to get in, hold, in contact with you personally how would they find you um the best thing is probably my linkedin um linkedin mm-hmm. or instagram and it's just my name lawrence stunning um, I'm pretty yeah. easy to find. Uh, I'm, I'm out there just like you are. And I think that's, uh, I think it's, it's great that one thing I really love about what you're doing, Deborah, is you're sharing your knowledge. And 
I, you also, you're remaining a student too. And I think that's the key to being good, to having a good life is you're trying to give back, but also you're learning and you're always working on yourself. I think having the balance between those two is really important. So I'm oh. pretty easy to find that I, uh, anyone, anyone can reach out. And it, for real estate, my LinkedIn, I, I do post a lot of stuff on real estate. It tends to be a bit more focused about the, the Chicago US market. So it's not probably yeah. too interesting for people, <laughs> people in New Zealand, <laughs> but, uh, but there is certain principles. Hopefully there's some crossovers there. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's Lawrence with a W, by the way. So you've got quite a unique name, which means you're quite easy to find. So Lawrence with a W, Lawrence Dunning. A bit of pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. And and look, I just want to reiterate, I do love doing these podcasts myself. Like you said, I'm always learning from them. Every time I sit here and I talk to anybody, first of all, I get to meet another amazing person, which I think is really important. And then I get to, I always see you know, little little things I take from it and go, yes, that's right. A little bit of a reminder sometimes, oh, we yeah, should, really should be doing that. And sometimes just something completely new. So yeah, I, I love I love doing these. And I really appreciate people who come on the show so thank you so much um, for your time well, thank, thank you, you for sharing your wisdom and um, sharing your experiences and we'll look forward to talking again soon no doubt thank you Deborah. and i feel the same way i feel very inspired right now motivated so i'm going to go to the gym right now and I, i've got good energy from you so thank you for sharing that i really appreciate uh, it absolute pleasure thanks very much <laughs>